But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated, and in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. And it went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot. And she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly, freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and went forth and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So God went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heaven, heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all of the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be for food for you, and as I give you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a, reckon, a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth is with you, as many as come out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall, the, shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. 
and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Thank you, Sally. Let's, let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you that um, even after you saved Noah, um, God, you were kind enough to give him sign after sign, mercy upon mercy, grace after grace, um, to show your love and to just show how amazing you are. Lord, I, I pray for us this morning as, as we look at this text, um, I, I don't know what we walked in the church with this morning, whether it is a lot of joy because of um, great things that you're doing in our life or, or a lot of sadness because of great, great loss and, and turmoil um, that we're feeling in, in life. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that you would meet us exactly where we are and show us your goodness, Lord. Um, let us feel the warmth of your smile and the warmth of your love this morning. We love you. For it's in Jesus' name that we come, in His name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, we, we open our service with Psalm 13, um, which, you know, says, How long, O Lord, right? Will you forget me forever? And, and I know that the psalm was obviously written by David, but I, I couldn't help but think of this psalm as, as, as I read the story of Genesis this week and, and thinking about Noah and imagining, okay, if I was stuck on this boat with my wife and kids and daughter-in-laws for a whole year and a whole bunch of animals that don't smell good, what would I be praying? Probably, how long, O oh Lord, right? I, I think a lot of us would, would be praying that. So, so if you remember what happened so far, Robert preached on this two weeks ago, sin filled the hearts of men, violence filled the earth, and so God was going to judge the world, but, this is the good news of chapter 6, verse 8, but Noah found favor, found grace with the Lord. And so God was gracious. He told Noah, he said, build an ark, which is a really, really big boat. He said, get in it with you and your family and some animals. And so then God shut them up in the ark and rain came down for 40 days and 40 nights, kind of what, you know, after our drought, how we got hit with all of that rain, God answered our prayer for rain and just gave it all at once, right? Imagine that for 40 days and 40 nights, completely flooding the earth, no land was seen anywhere. Then the water sat there for 150 days. So think about this. Noah heard from God all throughout this whole time. God said, the earth is sinful, I'm going to flood it. Noah, I love you, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to establish my covenant and continue my promises through you. And so God told him, this is how big the boat needs to be, this is what you need to do, here's the wood, here's the supplies, here's the people I want you to put in, here's the animals I want you. God was talking him throughout this whole process, and then God shuts him in, and for six months, at least from what we know, nothing, nothing, nothing. He gets shut up in his narrow prison, seemingly abandoned to his fare, and he cannot help himself. And in the midst of this flood where God is reckoning with sinners, it, it seems as if God stops speaking to Noah. It seems as if God's gone silent. He, he, he had to have thought, obviously, at first, what in the world have I done to obtain such a mercy? I mean, I'm sure that as the floodwaters came down, Noah had to be thinking to himself, how am I any different than these people? My heart is sinful. My wife is sinful. My kids are sinful. Their spouses are sinful. We're all fallen. We all deserve God's judgment. And then I'm sure as, as the months came on and he stopped hearing from God, I wonder if, if Noah thought, has God's mercy come to an end for me? as he left me here in this gigantic ocean to die. And, and maybe, just maybe, as I'm saying this, maybe you resonate with that. Maybe you, you have felt shut in and abandoned before. Have you, have you ever felt like you're alone in this world and your sorrow and your suffering and your hurt and your pain and your isolation and saying, no one can relate. No one has any idea what I'm going through. 
Maybe you, you feel that God's silent and maybe He's forgotten you. I mean, maybe even this morning you feel that way. Maybe you felt so alone because you haven't felt like you've heard from God in forever, and this morning it was you driving your ark to church, really lonely, going, God, where, where are you? This, this lonely ark of depression, this lonely ark of sorrow, this lonely ark of hopelessness that we sit in the parking lot of church like some of us do, maybe even some days when we come home from work, we sit in our driveway and we just say, oh, Lord, how long? How long, oh, Lord? Nothing in you may want to be here this morning. But for some reason, by God's grace and His providence, you're here, right? You're here. And if, if that's the case, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, I feel that way. Some sermons, I think I said that a few months ago, I was like, I don't want to be here this morning. I don't want to be preaching this sermon. I'm excited about this sermon, but, but some days I do feel like uh, the last thing I want to do right now is, is come and see people and have to put on a happy face, right? So we say, come, come as you are, and there's nowhere else I'd rather you be this morning, Nowhere else I'd rather you be because this morning I have such good news for you because I too have felt like Noah. I too have felt exactly like Noah in this moment and if you feel like Noah, I got good news for you. I want you to know this. This is our first point today. God remembers his people. If, If you feel like Noah, I want you to know that God remembers his people. Look at chapter eight, verse one. It starts with, but God. Now, again, I always say this. I said this when we were in Ephesians. Whenever you see but God, that is one of the most hopeful conjunctions you'll ever read in the entire world. This is one of the most hopeful things because in the bleak backdrop of the judgment waters that have swallowed the wicked, and and Noah sitting in this silent, isolated, seemingly spiritually alone and desolate ark, wondering, probably lost in his own mind, we find these words, but God. What does God God do? He remembers Noah. Now, obviously, God hasn't forgotten Noah. God knows all things, But, but this is written in terms that we, as humans, with our finite brains, we can understand, right? Because God hasn't spoken to Noah from what we know. Noah hasn't heard from God in months, in six months. And, and, and God acts, and it's like Noah's depression must have fled away as fast as the clouds flew away on a sunny day after the storm. The, the, the clouds lift, the sun begins to shine, and here's this hope. Friends, God remembers His people. This is so hopeful, and, and let me say this, the hope is so much deeper than just like, yeah, God knows what you're going through, and He's aware of you. Our, our hope is is that if if God has not acted in your life for what seems like a very long time, He will act again. You're near and dear to His heart. And that's exactly what He does here. Exactly what He does here. Just like God does in Genesis 1 when He created the world, what we see is, in a sense, a recreation. We see that the Spirit starts to move. This is The end of verse one, God made a wind blow, this divine wind, the Holy Spirit, like hovering over the face of the deep, like in Genesis chapter one. And God begins to work. And we see in these 20 verses, we see God remember Noah in four big ways. The first is this. In verse one to five, we see that God removes the water. God removes the water. At this point in the story, there's no life in the world except for that which is contained in this ark. But the Spirit of God, this divine wind, just like in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, hovers over the face of the deep and land and water begin to separate again. The mountains start to peek out from their drowned state. Vegetation begins to renew itself and the ark comes to rest, which is the same Hebrew word we know, from the end of Genesis 1, where God rested when it was finished. It's the same word. Church, I I know that this morning some of us might feel like we're left to drown in life, right, all alone. We're isolated in our ark, just floating around, waiting for a sign. But take heart, because in God's perfect 
timing, His waters around you will subside and fruit will eventually come. It takes time, but fruit will eventually come. And, and as we wait, we can, like Noah, rest. We can rest in Him and His promises. So God removes the water. Second, God gives a sign. We see this in verses 6 all the way through verse 12. So, like I said, Noah had to wait, so he waited 150 days, God acted. And then he had to wait another 150 days for the water to dry up. And so God gives Noah a sign in the meantime. What, what he does is Noah sends out a raven. He sends out a raven to see if the waters are dried up. And were they dried up? Not yet. Then he sends out a dove, which is a pure bird. Some people say maybe it symbolized the Holy Spirit. Um, but he sends out a dove, still no dry land. And even though Noah had God's promise, right? He had the promise of God. He saw God working. Still, he had to wait. Now, Jim's probably relieved to know, here's a sermon on patience. You don't have to preach. I get to preach this one. But he had God's promise. He had God's work. And still, God gave him a sign. This is what's amazing about the grace of God. Now, while he's waiting on the Lord, and while he's being patient and being obedient, God still gives him a sign. And, and I think we can hold both of these truths together. Because sometimes God doesn't always spare us in hard times in life, right? He, he doesn't always spare us from the distresses of our life, but, but in the darkest moments, we see his light so clearly and so brightly and so sweetly. Now, I don't, I don't know, some of you guys know this because you've been here since we planted four years ago, but when we planted a church here four years ago, four months into the church plant, the bottom fell out, right? Those of you who know the story say that's a nice way to put it, right? Friends and mentors of ours for decades that we've known that have walked through really hard things, they just deserted us, just said, I'm out, and they all dropped like that. And those who stuck around, most of them turned on us and accused us. And, 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 and it was such a, a, a dark time. I, mean, I remember praying Psalm 13 and Psalm 46 over and over going, how long, O Lord, you're my refuge. And this weird tension and this tug and this, this pull that, that I had with it, sleepless nights that I had with the Lord just crying out, saying, why and how long? When is this going to end? When is this going to end? And, and I remember this specifically because about a month into our sleepless nights, I remember in, in, in our life, Michelle and I found out that we were pregnant with our first kid, Harper, you guys know. And when we, we were, I remember Harper, we just like the name. It doesn't mean anything except the one who plays harps. Um, and so I remember we were kind of thinking through, okay, what, what should we name for her middle name? And, and as Michelle and I were reflecting just on that entire season of our life, we came across the name Eleanor, which is her middle name, and it means the light of God. Because in, in that very, very dark, bleak, sad, depressing, long night-filled time where I looked around and all I saw was darkness, God just gave this glimmer of hope, and He's like, I love you. I love you so much. Have this blessing. We, we don't deserve a kid, right? And, and God was so gracious and so kind to just say, here, this is yours. Church, we need to be reassured of God's kindness even in the midst of our turmoil, that He's there with us and He loves us. And I know that sounds like a really cheesy story, but that sometimes I, I know the promises, I see God working, I feel like Noah and doing all that, and God is still so kind that He says, on top of all of that, let me just give you this, this blessing. Know that I'm good. Know that in the darkness, I'm light. Know that in your turmoil, you have hope, and we can be reassured as a church that God has not forgotten us. Not only does He know our distress, but He knows us in our distress. He remembers us, and He works all things together for our good and for His glory. So we see God remove the water. We see God give Noah a sign. Third, we see God recreate the world. We're going to get into this a little bit more when we look at God's covenant, but you can do a word study if you want, or we can talk after service, but there's a lot of imagery and a lot of parallels that happen between Genesis 8 and Genesis 1, which is really fascinating. You can actually find links to all seven days of creation. 
but we'll move on. Number four, God speaks to Noah. We see this in verse 15 to verse 17. So remember, the last thing that Noah heard from God before he got in the ark was, go into the ark, you and your household, for I've seen your righteous before me in this generation. And then God shuts the door in chapter 7. And according to this account, God may not have spoken to Noah for about a year after that. And while this go into the ark for you are righteous, that sounds like a very affirming statement coming from God, if that's the last thing you hear for a whole year, I know if he's like me, the silence then could be deafening, right? But alas, God breaks the silence and he speaks to Noah. He commissions him with the same mandate he gave to Adam. He says, be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Now, we'll get into that a little bit more in just a second. But first, I want us to see how Noah responds. In verse 18 to 20, we see Noah remembers God. So God remembers Noah, and that leads then Noah to remember and respond to God. You think after all that time of loneliness, silence, and isolation, he probably questioned God's goodness, maybe even would be tempted to forget God's goodness, or maybe even come out questioning can I still trust God after that year? Can I still actually know that God is good and for me after that incredibly hard time? But what we see is actually the opposite with Noah. We see him obey God. God says, go out from the ark, chapter 8, verse 16, and in chapter 8, verse 18, what does he do? He goes out from the ark. He obeys God. Now, you think at this point, you haven't been on land for a year. You probably got your sea legs. You probably want to go sit, watch a sunset, kick back, enjoy a nice cold beverage um, and with your wife, right? I think I would. That's how I would want to do it. We all like to come home from a long day of work, kick it, relax, maybe watch something fun on TV. Um, I, I know for some of us, it's, it's tempting after getting through a really, really tough time, not just a hard day at work, but even through a really tough time and just say, I need a break, I need a rest, I need to chill out. And what's fascinating about this account is that God actually gives Noah permission to do so. He says, Noah, enjoy your wife, fill the earth, relax, enjoy. And Noah would eventually do that, but first he does something else. He builds an altar. He builds an altar, we see in verse 20. And he gathers his family and he says, we need to give thanks to the deliverer who delivered us from the flood. Now notice, his first action is not to relax, but to rejoice. His first action is not to relax, but to rejoice, and there is a difference. See, Noah comes and he says the way we'll actually find rest is in, is in God, not in kicking our feet up and not doing anything, because that will actually give us rest for our souls. And so, Not only does then Noah obey God, but but he approaches God after God tells him, you're righteous, he approaches God as a sinner. He approaches God as a sinner. He sacrifices clean animals and birds, which signify a sin offering. How do I know that? Because Moses, who we know from the book of Exodus, Moses wrote these first five books of the Bible, and he wrote them all together. And so when Noah is writing this account, he's writing to a people that understand the sacrificial system. The sacrificial system. So then Noah then doing this, and Moses drawing very clear attention to their clean animals, he's trying to help the readers see that Noah is approaching God as a sinner trying to make a sin offering. And then Noah is approaching God by the means that God gave, not the means that Noah saw fit or Noah liked or the, this is how I feel connected with God. No, no, no. Noah said, no, God, how you want me to approach you is how I'll approach you. And that's exactly what he did. And he did so because he saw his need for atonement. Noah is doing immensely priestly things here. He's acting like a priest here. He's, he's making propitiation, which is a very big word. We sometimes use it here at Grace. Propitiation is basically making right what was made wrong, okay? It's making right what was made wrong. And so Noah then 
is, is trying to make right what was made wrong by God's sacrificial system. There, there had to be an atonement because Noah realized, even though I found grace and favor with God, I'm still a sinner. I, I, I'm redeemed, I still sin. Both of these things are true. And this is why the sacrificial system was put into place in the Old Testament. The wages of sin is death. And so what priests would do in the sacrificial system is that they would offer spotless lambs and spotless animals and clean animals and clean birds as a sacrifice for sin. And what's wild about this is in verse 21, it says, God, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, which, which means that, that when Noah made this sacrifice, it, it made God pleased. It made him delight. It stirred his heart. He loved it. He said, ah, that's the smell of a heart devoted to me. And, and how do I know? Because it's not because of the animals that were being offered. A lot of us know Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So it wasn't the animals that made God say, hmm, that smells good. No, it was Noah's heart. It was his heart. Now we know from the book of Hebrews that the blood of animals doesn't actually remove sin. What it does is it, the whole sacrificial system was pointing towards something greater, something more than what the animals actually did. Hebrews chapter 10 is very clear that the blood of animals does not remove sin. What it does is it shows our need for atonement, our need for redemption, our need for propitiation. And even in Noah's pleasing sacrifice, which God accepted, there was still something greater that it's pointing to, still something better. It was pointing to the spotless lamb of God, Jesus, who God put forth as the perfect sacrifice to put away all of our sin. That's what it was pointing toward. That's what it was pointing toward. It was, it was pointing toward the fact that none of us will actually be able to please God on our own. Even with the cleanest animals that we have, the best sacrifices that we could come forth to God saying, God, look at all these great works that I've done. He said, yeah, that's not what's going to stir my heart. What's going to stir my heart is your broken heart. Only the sacrifice of Jesus will appease God because all of us, even on our best days, we fall short of God's glory. Even on our best days. So what do we do? We humble ourselves then, right? Under the mighty hand of God and we repent of our sin. God doesn't need our, our animals or, or our money or our cars or saying, oh, well, we'll, we'll give you Sundays as long as the cowboys aren't playing. We'll give you this, we'll give you that. God, God doesn't want us to barter. He, he, just, he, he just wants us. So what do we do? We repent of our sins and we believe in Him. He doesn't need our, our, our good works, our good attempts, us trying to barter with Him. He has Christ's finished work on your behalf. He has all that He needs. He is fully satisfied. If you are in the blood of Jesus, if you have repented of your sins and believed in Him, God looks at you and says, you're perfect. You're righteous, eternally righteous. You have the imputed righteousness of my son, Jesus. And so my question then for you is, is not, are you as good as Jesus to make God like you, but is your heart broken? Is your heart broken? Is it contrite? When, when you sin, it's not, do you sin or do you not sin? That's not the test of a Christian. The test of a Christian is, when you sin, does it break your heart like it breaks God's? Do you come before your sin and say, God, against you and you alone I have sinned. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. Like That's what God wants. That's what he finds acceptable. That's what's pleasing to him when we repent of our sins and place our faith in Jesus and say, all of my hope, I have no other hope than to just throw it into the arms of Jesus. He alone can save me. All right, one more thing before we move on. After God decreates in the flood, which Robert covered, he then recreates and makes everything new. Notice this. We have a new creation account. All seven days are mirrored. We have a new earth. There's a new humanity. Everyone came from Noah. 
God gives a new blessing. And what God actually does, this is fascinating, he reaffirms two huge things that he gave to Adam. He says, be fruitful and multiply, and you're made in my image. He reaffirms these things. Now, at this point, I have to ask, have you ever thought, what if, what if Adam and Eve didn't sin? Or, what if then God just said, okay, all right, start over. Me and my wife, we're going to try it, and we'll do better. Have you ever thought, I mean, seriously, have you ever thought, and I, I know movies have explored this, books have explored this, what if we just reset the world, started humanity over, and gave it another go? Would it be better? Would it be better? Would we have done any different? Because basically, at the end of verse 19, into verse 20, what we have is a new everything. New everything. Everything's new. It's like it's Eden all over again, except one thing's not new. Look at verse 21. The intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. So everything's new. It's like we're in Eden. And the ark even lands on Mount Ararat, which people think that's where the Garden of Eden was. And so there's a lot of imagery and a lot of things pointing towards a recreation account. But the hearts of men are still fallen. And sin still infests mankind. That's, that's what's fascinating about this. See this dichotomy, right? The, the, the world is beginning to renew itself. And, and this first family is, has found favor in the eyes of God. They're righteous in His sight. And God's judgment has come to an end. And I'm sure then after we read verse 21, the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth, we go, okay, well, what in the world is going to stop this from happening again? And it's into this context that God gives Noah his covenant. This is the second big thing that we see this morning is that God reaffirms his covenant. There's a lot to get into, so let me kind of break it down into three bite-sized pieces. The first is this, God reestablishes his preservation. God reestablishes his preservation. Now, I say reestablished here because he's continuing the promise that he made to Adam and Eve. I, I went over this in our first sermon, our, our overview of Genesis. You guys, um, if you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. You can check all that out. But it, it, this isn't a new covenant. God's establishing it, which is biblical language, for I'm reestablishing. And if you think, okay, Michael... Where do you get this from? When God starts a new covenant, it says, I'm going to cut a covenant with you. When you whenever you see any of the covenants in the Bible, it's always God's cutting a covenant with you. And when he says, I'm establishing my covenant with you, what he's doing is he's re-upping on an already established covenant, already existing covenant. And what is this covenant? That God would preserve his creation, that he would be with his people, that he would love them and keep them for all time. And this covenant, it's, it's unilateral, it's eternal, and it's gracious. It's unilateral. That means it's established by God. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this so far, because I feel like we're flying through Genesis, but still, you guys haven't read all the story of Noah in one sitting, maybe. Up until this point, Noah hasn't said a single word in all of Genesis. He hasn't said a single word. Contrast that with God who in this passage alone, when he's giving this covenant to Noah, it's drawn to our attention seven times that God speaks. Seven times. Not, which not only communicates a, a high picture of God as one who speaks and interacts with his creation, but also the nature of God's revelation. This isn't man pontificating or, or having thoughts about, oh, I wonder what God's like, so I'm going to write it down. No, God told us. God told us what he's like. He said seven times, he said, this is, what, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing. This is who I am, this is what I'm doing. That's all God does all throughout Scripture. We don't need to sit here and go, I wonder what God's like. We, 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 have, we have it right here. We have the truth. We know what God's like, and he's spoken to us. This, this covenant is not a bargaining between man and God like some old myths of this Mesopotamian age would indicate so. 
And, and God isn't responding to anything amazing that Noah's done. Remember, Noah is a sinner. Noah's coming to God broken. God is simply acting out of His love, and He is the one establishing the terms of the covenant. He is the one acting here. So it's unilateral. Second, it's eternal. It's eternal because God's eternal. Now, this doesn't mean that this covenant's going to last as long as God lasts. Rather, when I say it's eternal, it means as, as long as this covenant exists, it's never changing. Until God fulfills this covenant, it will stand and be unaltered. Notice in verse 21 and 22 how many times God says never. He says it three times. And then he even re-ups in verse 22 and says, when the earth remains, in case you didn't catch what never means, in seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer, winter, day and night shall not cease. In case you don't understand what never is, let me define it. Never. Now, I know you and I tend to throw around that word never. Like last night, I'm never staying up for another game like that. I, I fell asleep around halftime. But, you know, we'll, we'll let someone down and go, well, I'm never going to do that again. That is a classic Michael trait. So what do I do? I overpromise and I underdeliver, and I let you down again. We, we throw that word around never, and, and we promise beyond what we can guarantee, but only God can say never and actually stick by it. Only God can say never and actually stick by it. One pastor said that God's promise never to do something or never to let something happen again are among the most precious promises in His Word, especially something this catastrophic. All right, so this covenant is unilateral, eternal, and gracious, meaning nothing in man, not even our obedience to the covenant terms, merit this grace. No one knows he's a sinner, and he knows full well Sin may erupt, and we might find ourselves in quite a predicament again. And don't worry, after we get to Noah, we'll actually see next week, sin erupts again in his life. And then in Genesis 11, we see it infest the whole world at Babel. But in spite of his sin, God is still gracious. God says, no, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to preserve humanity. I will never destroy them again. So, we see, first, God reestablishes His preservation. Second, this is the central feature of the covenant, God recommissions His people. He recommissions His people. These are the stipulations that God says, this is then what you should do. That's what I'm going to do. This is what you should do. He recommissions His people, and this is twofold. First, God recommissions the creation mandate. Now, the creation mandate is what he gave to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.26, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Now, I want you to notice in our passage today, we saw in chapter 8, verse 17, God says, be fruitful and multiply on the earth. In chapter 9, verse 1, God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Okay? And then in chapter 9, verse 7, he says, be fruitful, multiply, increase greatly on the earth, multiply in it. So not only does God say this three times, which should set off light bulbs for us, but it's ascending in value. It's ascending greatly in specificity. It's, it's ascending in its length. We are, as his image bearers, we are to fill the earth with the glory of God. We're to fill the earth with his glory. And then he also says, you have dominion over the animals. Okay, so he recommissions the creation mandate, and then second, he recommissions the Imago Dei, which is that we're made in the image of God. I want you to look at verse 5 and 6. Understand the logic here. God says, since you are created in the image, my image, you have my likeness, and because of that, you are of such value. And since the blood or the life of man is God's alone, then to take a human life would be to usurp the authority and sovereignty that God alone has. And so then what you're doing by murdering is you're trying to play God. Do you understand that logic? And to usurp God's sovereignty over life and death, God says, that merits death itself. Let me help you see it another way. 
in chapter 6, verse 11, it says that the earth was filled with violence. The earth was filled with violence. If you remember back to creation, that's the opposite of what God intended. The, what God intended for creation was for the earth to be filled with His glory. But man in his sinfulness filled it with violence. And so what did God do? He, he wiped away everyone in the flood. Well, God just said, I'm not going to do that again. So he then tasked man, just like in the garden, he said, you as my image bearer, resemble me, mirror me, and do what I would do on the earth. So then God gave man the task to hold back the violence by upholding the image of God, the Imago Dei, and enacting God's justice on earth. A life for life. In short, what these verses show us as image bearers is that we are to image God's glory on earth, in everything, everywhere, all the time. All right, let's look at the last part of the covenant. God redirects His punishment. God redirects His punishment. So we see God's gracious. This is what He promises to His people. I'm going to preserve you for all time. And then He says, here, I'm going to recommission you as my people. And then lastly, God redirects His punishment. Let me read verse 13 again. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. I've set my bow in the cloud. Now, a lot of us know this as the rainbow, the rainbow. In the 1800s, there was a Scottish minister named George Matheson. And George Matheson, when he was in seminary around the age of 20, because I guess maybe, maybe back then when they didn't have TV, they were a lot smarter earlier, I don't know. Um, but he was in seminary at the age of 20, and he began to go blind. And his fiancée at the time actually left him found out he was going blind. She said, I don't want to be married to a blind guy. I'm out. And it broke his heart. And his sister then started taking care of him and actually helped him through Hebrew, helped him through Greek. Now, my sister loves me. I don't know if she loves me that much. If any of you guys have taken Greek and Hebrew, you're like, "Mm mm-hmm. And even helped him in his early years in ministry. For 20 years, his sister helped him in all of his tasks, in all of his note writing, in all of his test taking, his sister was there for him. When he was 40 years old, she met a man and was going to get married. And I'm sure that then, at that moment, your your lifelong companion, your ministry partner, the person that's been there, your ride-or-die person that's then moving on to get married leaves you. I'm I'm sure, especially after losing his fiancée over his blindness, I'm sure that had to bring up a lot of emotions and a lot of sadness. In fact, the night of her wedding, he commented and said, it's like an incredible sadness passed between me and the Lord. And heartbreak hit him all over again. And the night of her wedding, he wrote a hymn in about five minutes, which if any of you guys have ever tried to write anything in five minutes, that's difficult, um, let alone a hymn that has stood the test of time for the last 200 years. And we're going to sing this in a minute, but, but I want to read to you the third stanza. This is what Matheson wrote. He said, O joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain. That morn, that morning shall tearless be. That, that, that third line about the rainbow, he's basing that in Genesis 9. And, and it's not a bow in some girl's hair, as cute as that would be. The word bow here is, is the Hebrew word for a battle bow. A battle bow. And that's what we see when we see the rainbow in the sky, right? We see a battle bow hung in the sky, and it has, it, has, it has nothing to do with leprechauns. It has nothing to do with sexual orientation. It's God's promise to his people. It's a picture of his goodness to us. And this is the picture that he gives. I won't flood the earth again. It's a battle bow that is cocked and aimed at himself. And he says, I will never lose this again. Except we saw it loosed on Christ at the cross for us. Where he went to die, not for his sin, but for our sins. So that we wouldn't have that loosed on us. 
God redirected His wrath on Jesus Christ at the cross so that then we would be saved and His wrath would be appeased. That's how justice and mercy come together in Christ. That's how justice and mercy come together at the cross. And when Jesus rose from the grave, what He showed us is that we now have victory over that sin and the death and the punishment that we deserved. And friends, if, if, if you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, trials can come our way and, and we don't just have to try to keep our head up or keep our head above the water. We can hold on to the covenant promises of God that are ours in Christ. Something I've started to do this year is, is, is read a lot more Puritans. And, and something that I love what the Puritans say I forget which Puritan says this, but, but he says, if, if, if you're not a Christian, every trial becomes a double trial. If you don't understand justification by faith, every trial becomes a double trial because not only are you having to work through the trial itself, but you're also questioning the whole time, does God love me? Does, is he pleased in me? Is, is this punishment for what I've done? And you start to spiral into all these other things and, and it becomes overbearing and it just weighs us down, but, but God set his bow in the sky to assure us of the promise that, yes, he loves us, and he'll keep you near and dear to him. And, and we can look, next time it rains, we can look and we can say, yes, that is a picture that every promise that we have in Scripture are yea and amen in Christ. Christ has died in your place, and the wrath of God was satisfied and released fully on Him at the cross. So not only does God forgive you, and things are okay there, but He loves you. He enjoys you. you you're pleasing to Him. And so when we can come with broken hearts like Noah in His sacrifice, we can come to the Lord, not only will we experience His forgiveness, but we'll also experience His love and His acceptance. Let me pray for us this morning.